the Malawi government decided to devalue their currency by 40% overnight. No explanations were given. You just wake up and your wealth has gone down by 40%. Bitcoin helps us to have financial freedom, independence, and autonomy. It doesn't really equate us to Westerners, but it gives us a level playing field where everybody can start from zero. Bitcoin helps us to pass wealth across borders. The dream of having hyper Bitcoinization is very possible. We import inflation from Western countries. It's basically like sending out our wealth and then getting back poverty in return. Bitcoin does not discriminate against your race, your gender, your geographical location. We have to drive the Bitcoin adoption. We we should not wait for any authority to <laughs> allow right. us that we can t- transact in Bitcoin. That's not the Bitcoin ethos. Bitcoin is the greatest educational tool that we have had in that it has opened our eyes to the financial injustices that have been done to us as the human race, right? Uh, by our governments, by the authorities that are above us. Why do you think is Bitcoin important for you uh, and in Africa especially? Um, so first things first, I would say in Africa, we kind of have a very um, broken monetary system. Uh, first of all, we have over 40 types of currencies. And trading, intertrading in Africa becomes very difficult because some of these currencies are either based on the US dollar or the francophone. Sorry, not francophone. What is called them? The France dollar, right? Is that how we call it? So it becomes challenging. Every time you want to make maybe the intertrade, you have to first convert your currency, which has no value across border into either the dollar, right? And then the person that you're trading with has to also convert the dollar to the fiat currency to actually make the trade possible. So trading becomes difficult, remittances becomes difficult as well. And then we have issues such as devaluation of currency. I don't know if you know this, but um, a couple months ago, uh, the Malawi government decided to devalue their currency by 40% overnight. So this was done overnight. Um, no explanations were given. You just wake up and your wealth, your whatever you have saved has gone down by 40%. So if you're making an income of probably $200 or $100 um, on a monthly basis, then that means your salary has been slashed off, right? Because that doesn't mean that the prices of goods will go down. So it becomes challenging for actually people to get out of that loop of poverty because of such things. We also have issues such as inflation, um, which affects our lifestyle as well. And Bitcoin comes in where Bitcoin definitely is a deflationary asset, right? And the fact that one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin anywhere, that makes that makes it even easier for us to actually do start doing trading across borders. When it comes to sending value across borders, it becomes less expensive. There's less bureaucracy. You know, you don't have anyone overlooking what you're, you're doing as well. So it makes um, sending information, sending data, sending value across border very easy in Africa for us. And then it gives us a platform where it doesn't really equate us to Westerners, but it gives us a leveled playing field where everybody can start from you know, zero, if you, if you wish to start from zero. It's fascinating that there are so many different currencies in there. Is the, because I was in Egypt once and I was fascinated that everyone was accepting euros. Like I, I didn't have to exchange, uh, I don't know what the, the currency is, their name, but I could uh, go there and uh, buy everything I want with euros. Like there was mm-hmm. no, not one shop or not one thing where they don't, didn't accept it. It's the euro and the US dollar, like the uh, stronger uh, fiat currencies, they're also, also big. Exactly, exactly. And you know, that's the most unfortunate part is that some countries in Africa, their, their fiat currency is actually really bad that they would rather accept dollar or the euro. Uh, so you have Egypt, uh, Egypt, there's also Zimbabwe as well. They would rather trade in the dollar other than their own fiat currency because um, it has lost value over time and there's no point in actually uh, doing trades with it. So we find a lot of people accepting foreign currency as opposed to theirs. And when you're in such an economy, what happens is you really don't grow as a country, 
right? Because you have based your value on a foreigner's currency. Interesting. What, what, what would you say is the biggest challenge out of those for Africa? Is it the the, the saving the value or is it the remittance uh, transferring the wealth? What is the biggest challenge in Africa that uh, Bitcoin is solving? I think probably um, it's wholesome, right? When it comes to store of wealth, um, if you're looking to probably save your wealth uh, in the next 10 years and you're having um, a government that can wake up and devalue your currency or inflation happening, then the best option for you would be to save in Bitcoin, right? And then the other thing, if you're doing trades or if you're sending, for example, if you're um, in the States and you're sending money back home, which is a huge way, it's, it's a huge income when it comes to African countries. So if you're sending money back home, then you need um, a currency that will not maybe probably have the most um, expenses attached to it, fees rather attached to it. So I would say Bitcoin is really wholesome. There's no one specific use case for Bitcoin in Africa, but people and individuals use it as part of their utility cases and as part of their challenges. Interesting. And you're also really big on uh, putting Bitcoin uh, for African women uh, because you said like they have a specific um, uh, challenges also. Uh, what are those and, and, and how did you, how do you try to uh, encounter them? Okay. So the biggest challenge that we face as African females is the inability to actually um, get on board in financial de decision makings, right? And this has been brought about by long-standing traditions and culture. And how does this look like? It manifests in forms of lack of education for the girl child, which um, at the end of the day causes you to miss out on job opportunities as well. We have issues when it comes to property rights. As a female, you're not allowed to inherit property. So which makes it even hard for you to get uh, probably credit from the bank if you want to get maybe a loan, it becomes sad for you as a female. Um, and this, again, like I said, it comes, it, it's just about traditions and cultural norms. And I guess this might also apply in other countries outside of Africa. But for us, it's truly a problem. I feel it's a problem because if we want to change the African narrative, our financial um um, our financial system, that we need to have everybody on board. That's what I normally say. We need to have everybody on board, everybody involved. And so for me, training or teaching um, or onboarding African females is not just about individuals. It's me looking at the next generation. Bitcoin helps us to pass wealth from one person to the other. Bitcoin helps us to pass wealth from one, from across borders. Bitcoin helps us to have financial freedom, independence, and autonomy. And if we can have everybody on board, then this, the dream of having a um, hyper-Bitcoinization world is very possible. Mm, that's, that's crazy. So you are saying that women in Africa aren't allowed to inherit property? Yes. Um, again, this is a tradition, and I get where probably our ancestors were coming from because when you're married off, then that would mean you're taking your property with you to a different family. So that was the thinking behind it, right? But then moving forward in this economy, it's not a practical tradition that should be, should actually be continuing to work, right? So one, because we are seeing cycles of poverty because a half of the population of Africa you know, which is the female, are depending on a very mi minority who actually are capable of standing on their own. So Africa as a whole does not have, um, let me say, economic wise, we are not, we are the richest continent when it comes to resources, right? But our economies are really doing badly off. So the men that we should be depending on are already struggling. And we, if we have like, probably we have about 1.4 billion people in Africa. So if you have half of that population, depending on a already struggling population, then what happens? You continue to see these cycles of poverty. So for me, having everybody on board, someone, everybody chipping in on the table makes us have more resources, which will lead to um, access to better education, which will lead to 
access to uh, better medical assistance leads to homes, you know, better homing environment and so on. This leads me to a question that I've never really asked before, but how do you think Bitcoin will influence romantic relationship and trust in marriage when all of a sudden you can actually verify, uh, like inheritance is like um, a government thing, but with Bitcoin, it's yourself. Like you can program that this Bitcoin will go to that person no matter mm. what, uh, which which could like take the trust out of finance and could like enhance like a romantic relationship to a sense. Like, did you ever thought about that? So from my point of view, this is how it helps in most uh, the cases that I've dealt with. So one of the issues that we have when it comes to marriages is either financial abuse or uh, physical abuse. And we've had cases in our community where we've seen ladies who are being both abused in either ways. And when they start earning in Bitcoin, they can start preparing their way out of these situations, right? So it kind of helps in some level. The other thing I would say, because Bitcoin is broad, right? It's a technology and it brings also opportunities. And we really don't have to wait on getting the traditional form of work, right? You can work online and get paid. So here comes um, a situation where a housewife can actually work online and earn in Bitcoin and thereby helping their partner. So for me, Bitcoin really makes a uh, marriage flourish as opposed to, you know, the kind of thinking we might have that if you have Bitcoin, then it's, you you kind of keep it secret from your partner and all that. So I think Bitcoin makes everything else flourish around us. Of that, I uh, feel a lot. It's re really cool to think like that. It's also interesting when we uh, think of the hundreds of different of power shifts that Bitcoin will do between, uh, let's say, America and Africa. There's a power shift happening with Bitcoin, but also between husband and wife is a power shift happening uh, <laughs> in, <laughs> in, with Bitcoin. That, that's, that's quite amazing to see, honestly. I, I, I think a, a Bitcoin world could be a, a very nice and, and trusting world. Obviously, uh, Bitcoin will not uh, prevent that you will be physically abused. So like Bitcoin does not help you protecting yeah. against physical abuse, but it gives you the financial tools to exactly. have an escape patch. So I think exactly. that's a, it's a, a really powerful thing. Exactly, exactly. And I don't really feel that Bitcoin uh, sort of shifts the power in couples. I feel it actually gives them more, you know, um, a reason to bond. So, for example, if you one of you decides to save in fiat, the other one decides to save in because at the end of the day, you need to pay your bills in your local currency. Right. And the other one decides, OK, let's put money in Bitcoin. Then 10 years, 20 years from now your kids will have the possibility of going to university because the price of Bitcoin mostly goes up, right? So I think it brings couples together. Uh, it makes them more as partners rather than one being a slave to the other or completely independent of the other. Yeah, I love that view a lot, really cool. Um, let's come to that power shift that I thought of, uh, told you about with America and Africa and other countries. How do you see in general Bitcoin empowering um, uh, countries that are reliant on other currencies and <laughs> US dollar is, is uh, the Americans are exporting the inflation into other current in other countries? I think there's like 66 countries that are reliant only on the US dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, don't have their own currency and there are then more countries like in Egypt where I paid with euros uh, where they have their own currency but still like the, the euro the dollar is, is quite popular there um, how will that uh, shift for uh, Africa go once we are in this utopian bitcoin standard world what do you think will, will happen there I think you've clearly stated it. One of the problems is they infl they actually export. We import inflation from, you know, uh, Western countries. And if you're using Bitcoin, then that stops. That means a more flourishing economy, right? Because the value is being transacted, uh, is, is being um, 
transferred within and also can be kept within the African countries, as opposed to exporting our value outside and importing inflation for us. So it's basically like sending out um, our wealth and then getting back poverty in return. So I think for me, that's the biggest, the biggest win for us as Africans. If we do adopt Bitcoin and we go to, we get to that utopian level where everybody actually accepts and uses Bitcoin as a whole. What are some challenges that, uh, that African faces in adopting Bitcoin? I, I always hear as answer scams. I feel like there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of scams going on, but uh, yeah. b besides the scams, maybe what, what, what are some challenges that, that you see in adopting Bitcoin? So probably infrastructure, um, when it comes to internet penetration, um, I would say that is one of the biggest challenges that we have, you know, electricity as well, which matters when you want to, you know, be able to be 24 seven online, right? Um, but luckily we do have projects and innovators such as um, Kogato of Machankura, who came up with this really cool tool that uses, um, we can be able to send value that is Bitcoin using a USSD platform. So whether you have the internet or not, you can actually be able to send and receive Bitcoin, which is really cool. But then uh, there are some countries in Kenya, we are lucky because we are considered as um, the technology hub of Africa. Um, so when it comes to certain infrastructure, we are actually lucky, but when you move outside, and that is just Nairobi, when you move outside of Nairobi, then that becomes a problem, right? So I feel that will be the biggest challenge. The other challenge would be education. Um, we have been, and I feel this is like global, it's not just African countries. Most of us and all, all of us have this bank mentality where we we would rather trust somebody else with our money other than ourselves. So the biggest thing is to, you know, help people and learn that, that you can actually, you know, have financial sovereignty by keeping your keys, by keeping your own money, right? So education is, 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 is one of the things that I would say is a big problem, getting to the grassroots level and actually meeting people at their own level other than imposing our own ideas. And that is one thing I feel that uh, as Bitcoin, Bitcoiners, we need to we need to change meeting people at their own level as opposed to, you know, trying to push your own opinions or on how you should people should actually use Bitcoin. So allowing people to, you know, use Bitcoin as per their utility. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, it's a lot of... Uh... <laughs> Now, now also with, with Michael Saylor, the, the debate's coming up with like self-custody and, and how you should use Bitcoin. But yeah, I think the, 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 the great thing with Bitcoin is that you have the option to leave it on exchange, to buy an ETF, to have it in self-custody. <laughs> you can have your, uh, I don't know, yeah. 12 multi-signature custody solution or like your free multi-signature collaborative custody solution. Like there are so many options. And you can mm -hmm. choose yourself. And I think that that is really powerful that we have the options. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, I want to highlight one thing you said. I think uh, a lot of the countries that I know that are listening to this, because I know uh, the, the biggest one is America, then UK, Canada, uh, Germany, and all those, those countries that are listening to this podcast, uh, they have like almost 100% electricity and internet penetration. Uh, mm -hmm. And you said like you, you have in Africa challenges even with like internet and electricity penetration. Exactly. Uh, so I think that's a very, um, uh, a challenge that most of my listeners probably don't even think about when they think about right. Bitcoin education. Um, exactly. How big of a problem is it? like, how, what do you know some numbers? Like what, what percentage of the, the country or like, uh, how, don't have electricity and don't have internet and, and then cannot even um, access uh, as Bitcoin. I also heard about uh, Machinkura, the, the service that is really cool also to, to send Bitcoin without an internet connection, just with your SMS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you're right. Uh, I, some people in this world don't even know how the struggle of having not to have electricity or internet, right? 
And I would say one of the countries that suffers from that is Nigeria and also South Africa as well. But I feel South Africa, they could be improving right now with the new administration. But that is something I would have to um, maybe confirm later on. Um, and I won't say I have a specific number, but it's a huge problem, right? It's a, it's, it's a huge problem. The majority of people who have electricity are the ones in urban centers. And even those of us who are in urban centers, it's not like guaranteed that you're going to have 24 seven electricity or internet throughout the month or throughout the year. Who knows? Um, the power could decide to go off right now as we're doing this <laughs> with this interview, right? So the numbers are huge. I would say that uh, the numbers are huge. And um, yeah, that's that's a really big problem for us. I just asked uh, meanwhile, ChatGPT. It's not always the best source, but they, it usually gives me some some number. <laughs> Better than nothing. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and they're saying 40 to 45 percent of the population uh, has no or almost no access to electricity. Is, is that something that, that seems uh, reasonable? I have, I'll say I think it's more. <laughs> I definitely feel it's more. Um, maybe so I would say chat GPT may say 40 to 45 percent because some people have access to electricity but it's not like certain, it's not guaranteed, right? So you might have days that you have electricity, you might have days that you don't. So that's why I'm saying it can be more than 40 to 45%. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin, keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure, it's simple to set up, it's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the bitcoin on an exchange and you can get a five percent discount with the code robin at the checkout visit bitbox.swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual you have to have the most secure self-custody setup you have to secure your own devices you have to protect your privacy you have to set up an inherent inheritance plan and depending on where you live you even want to have a plan b a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really really wrong and through all those steps the bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step and if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty and last but not least i have something completely new for you guys i partnered up with coin vigilante this is the most beautiful bitcoin timepiece that i ever saw created by anyone look at that beauty i love it so much coin vigilante made an perfect bitcoin watch that's the perfect subtle elegant way to go out there and show that you are a bitcoiner and that watch brand is bitcoin only and coin vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing genesis edition of their watch collections you have the date of the first ever mined bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in i love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions i love those watches so so much interesting yeah <laughs> it's it's so fascinating and that's why i made the podcast in english um, a lot of people think that i make it in english to reach a a bigger audience which is a really weird argument because there are so much bigger challenges uh, so much bigger um uh channels in german out there the, than i am so it's <laughs> a lot of growth potential in the german market yeah. but the interesting thing is when you get out of this austria germany bubble you really see other uh, you, you see the, a better perspective on on the world and i know it's a big thing in Austria if the electricity isn't there for just a day. Like, it's like, oh, we don't have electricity. I cannot do any. Like, there's like a big outrage when you're like, for one day in the year, there's no electricity. Uh, and I'm always like, there are countries uh, where people live 
they don't have electricity even one day in, in, a, in, in a year. <laughs> exactly. And we are, we are freaking out if we have one day no electricity. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, and probably that is why I would say, I think more Bitcoiners and more people should have um, an open mind to understanding how Bitcoin can be used by other people as opposed to imposing their own ideologies, right? Because I've, I've seen a lot of fights on Twitter on how people should actually use Bitcoin. Don't sell your Bitcoin. I've seen that. Don't sell your Bitcoin. Don't spend your Bitcoin. But what happens if I want to send value to somebody in Nigeria and they have a limit to what they can actually withdraw via ATM, right? So what happens then? I would have to use Bitcoin, right? So like I said, the issue with Bitcoiners, you know, always trying to impose their own ideologies. You're in your own country, you're in your own bubble. You're probably your monetary system is working perfectly. Um, and then you hear other people are using probably Bitcoin in trades and you're like, why the hell are they using Bitcoin? They should save it for the next 50 years or so, right? Uh, it's, that's really fascinating for me because... Uh, I see it all the time. People have their own beliefs completely outside of Bitcoin and put it on Bitcoin and then think that everyone else also has to think like that. For example, about carnivore. Uh, there's a lot of health benefits. Uh, I, I get it. Uh, carnivore is, is great. But we should not expect that every Bitcoiner now only eats meat. <laughs> Uh, and and and, yeah. the, and the same with everything as like it, uh, there are so many bitcoiners out there with such a strong opinion on things that have nothing to do with bitcoin uh, mm -hmm. and they're like okay now uh like for example weightlifting i d do it myself and i think it's great for your body but we <laughs> it's not a bitcoin of thing like, like if you don't <laughs> you, you you can be a bitcoiner without lifting weights exactly. even if, if, even though it's great to make sports and even though it's great to, to lift weights but i think we should stop putting our own beliefs on bitcoin and think that everyone has to have those same beliefs exactly and i i normally say and i tell my community this the reason why I feel the Bitcoin community isn't growing as much as the crypto community is because of these sort of like gatekeeping ideas. You know, for you to be a Bitcoiner, you have to be, uh, you know, go through the carnivore diet plan. You have to lift weight. You have to, you know, store your wealth in Bitcoin for the next 50 years. You have to act a certain way. And it actually... Uh, it, it brings fear and doubt to non, you know, non-Bitcoiners because they're like, is this a cult? You know, why, why would I need to do all this? Like, it's crazy. It gives them fear. Why should I get into this if these are the terms? And, you know, it's like we have certain terms and conditions that we have to follow as Bitcoiners, which is actually not helping us um, in actually bringing more people into the Bitcoin space. And I would say this, if we do want to get to that level of hyper-Bitcoinization, I don't know when this will be, but we need to be more open-minded. We need to, you know, allow people to use Bitcoin and have their own lifestyle outside of Bitcoin as they deem fit. I 100% agree. I think we have to be uh, way, way more open as a, as a community. And yes, it sometimes seems like a cult. <laughs> I totally understand <laughs> that, but it's, but it's also maybe a feature of it because, uh, we are really, uh, holding together strongly, like the, the strong community aspect, even it, it seems like gatekeeping and it, it's, it's, it's interesting for me to, to have this discussion because it's, we have so many uh, big uh, Bitcoiners in the scene uh, that have really strong beliefs and put it on Bitcoin, and I think that's wrong. Uh, but at the same time, it's it's things that unites us for for some reason. Uh, and then uh, I was actually at Bitcoin Amsterdam and was asked by Isabella, uh, "What you?" Because I interviewed almost now three hundred Bitcoiners, and she asked me, "Oh, you inter interviewed now almost three hundred Bitcoiners? What is a Bitcoiner?" No. And I gave this long, long speech uh, about what Bitcoiners think. And then I ended my, my thing with like, oh, a Bitcoiner is a human being. Like, 
<laughs> that's, that's the only thing that unites all Bitcoiners. We are exactly. all human beings. That, that's the only thing beings. that actually unites us. Exactly. And I feel for one thing, uh, one thing that actually Satoshi Nakamoto really thought about is the human race as opposed to a specific niche of people. Because Bitcoin does not discriminate, discriminate against, you know, your race, your gender, your geographical location, even your own economic, um, your social status. It gives everybody a platform to start from wherever they can and, um, you know, grow from wherever they can. So for us to come with these strong ideologies, then it beats the point um, of what Satoshi Nakamoto's dream was, which is bringing humans together to get that one goal, which is financial freedom. And if you don't have financial freedom, then you're basically a slave to the system and the system is the enemy, not the next person. That's that's really cool. Um, what do you think with, with that, keep with keeping that in mind, what do you think is the biggest impact that Bitcoin will have uh, on the world once it's successfully uh, really there? I think Bitcoin is the greatest educational tool that we have had in that it has, for those people who've actually tried to understand what Bitcoin is and the benefits of actually using it, um, it has opened our eyes to the injustices, financial injustices that have been done to us as the human race, right? Uh, by our governments, by the authorities that are above us. And um, if we do get to that level, then we would not have enemies unless you're just dumb or just thick headed and you've decided, you know, this group of people, these ones are not supposed to be using Bitcoin, right? I feel um, unifying people would be the biggest, the greatest uh, uh, benefit of using Bitcoin. And I have seen this while attending conferences, you know, uh, Bitcoin conferences normally bring people from different um, continents. And when we come together in such confer conferences, I have felt people leaving, you know, their own perception of which clique I should be in with. And actually, they have tried to understand people from the level of, hmm, how do you see Bitcoin? How do you view Bitcoin? How do you use Bitcoin in your world? How do you use Bitcoin for the challenges that you're facing? So it's a unifying factor. That's a very big deal for me. It's a unifying factor. And that said, I would like to just put this in there. We have the African Bitcoin Conference. So it's a chance for anyone who, out there who's never been to Africa. It's going to be in Kenya at the prestigious hotel, which is JW Marriott from the 9th to the 11th of December. It's a great opportunity to meet African Bitcoiners, look at the innovations that we've had, you know, connect and network and just, you know, uh, enjoy Kenya as a country. I, I love that a lot. Yeah, it's, uh, I think we we have to get to more Bitcoin conferences. <laughs> I think exactly. that, 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 exactly. that's something uh, so valuable, just like meeting on a local meetup or like on conferences or like however you, you do it. Uh, there are so many different ways. Meet Bitcoiners in real life. It's, it's a life hack. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And you get to collaborate, you know, you get to exchange ideas, you get to learn from others, you even get to understand, wow, like, I'll, I'll give you an example. When I attended the um, Global Bitcoin Summit, we had human rights activists. So the GBS is done by the Bitcoin Park and HRF. And I was fortunate enough to be um, to be part of that. And listening to the stories by human rights activists, I was like, wow, you know, I thought we have problems. There are people who are actually facing bigger problems and using Bitcoin to actually help you know uh the situation at, at they are facing absolutely uh what are you currently working on in, in in bitcoin you have the data on uh so what, what are you doing okay so let me start by explaining what bitcoin data is so essentially bitcoin data is um a non-profit organization that focuses on empowering the african female through financial education and we leverage on Bitcoin to do that, uh, mainly because it's decentralized. So we do not need the permission of anyone to actually do what we, we are doing, right? Um, so under Bitcoin Data, we have several programs. We have like the 
shirt that I'm wearing, Dada Devs. So Dada Devs is um, the latest program that we've started. And the reason why um, I felt this was important is because we have the technically inclined students in our community, developers. So what we are trying to do is giving already existing African female developers the knowledge to be able to contribute and even build on the Bitcoin ecosystem. Um, we have other programs such as the Dada Entrepreneur. So Dada Entrepreneur basically helps female entrepreneurs in Africa uh, integrate Bitcoin into their businesses. So it helps them. Um, how does it help the businesses? It helps them in expanding the, you know, expanding their reach to other outside of their communities to other other countries i would give you a very good example of a female who's been able to do this her name is sarah she's from the community and when she joined bitcoin dada it was because she had a client from nigeria um and she wanted to you know send her some products and the lady was willing to pay her in Bitcoin, but Sarah did not have any information about Bitcoin. She could not understand what it was and she missed that particular opportunity. So a couple of months later, she came across Bitcoin Dada and, and she joined us and she started using Bitcoin. So she's been able to expand her business, not just in Kenya, but also in another country, which is Uganda. So it helps the students actually, or the female uh, entrepreneurs expand their market outreach. Um, we have things like um, the Chama program where we, one of our main goals is to ensure every lady in the community owns some percentage of Bitcoin. And the reason why this is, in, is important, as much as we use Bitcoin to send and receive value, we are also trying to, you know, create wealth for the next generation. So we do this by DCAing, you know, every week we have some amount of money that we purchase Bitcoin and they're able to do this from as low as one dollar. So you're given the opportunity to start from whatever amount of money that you want to start. So you can start stacking one dollar. $500, that really depends on you. Um, the other program that we have, we do community outreach. Um, so Bitcoin data essentially is not really, like I said, it's not for individuals. We're trying to make our communities better as well. And we are working with underprivileged kids. Uh, specifically in Kenya, we work with um, a, a school in one of the biggest uh, slums in Africa, which is called Kibera. And uh, what we're trying to do is to eradicate um, period poverty. So talking about even uh, period in, in Africa is like a taboo. And I think this is across everywhere. It's, it's, it's a topic that it, people shy away from, right? So what happens with these underprivileged kids, they tend to run away from school uh, because they cannot afford things like hygiene products such as sanitary towels. So we come in by purchasing these sanitary towels and just, you know, engaging these girls, giving them advice and ensuring that they actually stay in school. Uh, we also work with Offense of Uganda, um, which is led by our community manager in, in Uganda. Her name is um, Edith Pomire. So for Bitcoin Dada is, is more of creating an inclusive environment where everybody can thrive and succeed at their own level. It's a, it's a great mission. Uh, I, I love that we, that we have like, um, almost this, <laughs> it's, it's interesting when we compare, it's maybe an interesting question. Uh, it has not, not too much to do with that now, but when you would have put uh, Bitcoin in the political, political corner, where, where would you put it? Because I, I, have, I, I struggle with that question a lot. Like, I think, I think it's too broad to put it somewhere. Do you have like an, a framework to think about that political in what sense i mean there's like uh, a, a liberal uh, political corner there's a communist political corner a socialist corner <laughs> uh, and and for me um it just came up in my mind because we when, when you talked about that it's like everyone deserves the same chance and there's like this debate between like liberals and and, and communists but like liberals are saying like oh everyone deserves the same chance and communists is more like oh everyone is the same <laughs> which is yeah. not, not true for me uh, mm. and, it, and it seems like um, uh, Bitcoin is a very liberal but 
at the same time very conservative um uh thing at the same I, I, it was just in my head i'm sorry but <laughs> it's maybe, maybe think, you have a thing for that i think uh bitcoin doesn't have like a specific area because i can say we have both extremists you know we have extremists in bitcoin as well who like i said are just focused on you know stacking 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 the others who believe that you should not even have like bitcoin in your wallet you should be able to send and send and send and send and send so it has both ends um but i would say the beauty about bitcoin again it gives us the platform where you can actually use it from your own point of view so you can decide to follow the extremists probably the crazy ones and you can also decide to follow the rest but at the end of the day um i feel if we probably read the bitcoin white paper and follow Satoshi's dream, which was peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, currency, to bring us hum the human race, our financial freedom back, then we will not have such debates at all. I love that a lot, really cool. Uh, on, on that note, um, do you think Bitcoin will change something in, in our culture, in our uh, living together? I think it, it already is. Um, it already is. Um, in terms, like I said, in terms of unifying people, and it not might be for everybody because, again, we come from different backgrounds, different environments. Um, we, we've grown from different cultures as well. But I feel it's a unifying tool for those who are open, you know, open minded or open hearted. And it has brought people um, who've actually, in the normal world, in the fiat system, would not even consider working together. Right. So, yes, it has already started changing the perception of how we see each other as a human race and understanding that um, it's not a specific race that's the problem, but it's actually the system that is the problem. And if there's some, a Bitcoiner who doesn't see it that way, then I don't think they actually understand Bitcoin. Absolutely. Very cool. Um, we come to our end routine of the podcast uh, where I always ask my guest, what can we learn from you? besides Bitcoin? What can you learn from me as an individual or from Bitcoin data? Uh, from, from you individually. Um, what can you learn from me as an indiv individual resilience? I would say, and the reason why I'm saying this is I started Bitcoin data with a group of 20 females who are just friends of my friends. I wasn't sure where I would be um, probably where we are at now, I wasn't sure, but I had a goal in mind and that was to bring financial freedom and independence to Africans. And I do that by including the African female. So if you're out there as a Bitcoiner and you're not sure at what capacity you can actually contribute, I would say this, learn from my story you know, start with whatever you have, that small idea that you keep on pushing, you're like, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not technical, you don't really need to be, and this is what I normally say, you don't have to be technically inclined to actually understand and use Bitcoin and to start contributing. There are a lot of ways that you can contribute in this space. I've seen artists, I've seen lawyers, I've seen developers, you know, I've seen creators, I've seen leaders, there are very many areas that you can actually contribute at your own capacity. And you can even do that not by deciding to impact the lives of millions of people, but just by starting with you and your own family. Start spreading your love uh, within your neighborhood and uh, with your exactly. loved ones. I think that's a great one. Exactly. And the other thing that I would add, I had this conversation um, with a friend yesterday and we were talking about the idea of hyper Bitcoinization. Like I said, I'm not sure if this is going to happen in uh, within this our generation, could be the next generation or maybe not. But if we do want to get to that level as Bitcoiners, we have to start from the grassroots level. We have to start with the next person. I mean, if you want to come to Kenya and spend Bitcoin, then there has to be somebody in Kenya who is actually doing the work, right? There has to be somebody in Kenya who is actually speaking to their shopkeeper and giving them, giving that information that, hey, 
why don't you start accepting Bitcoin, right? So it starts from us and as individuals um, and not waiting for the governments to actually start accepting Bitcoin. It could happen, which would be great if the governments would wake up and say, okay, we are ditching the fiat currency or we are actually incorporating Bitcoin. But then it starts from us. Love that a lot. Really cool. It, we we have to drive the the Bitcoin adoption. We we should not exactly. wait for any authority to <laughs> allow right. us that we can t transact in Bitcoin. That's not the Bitcoin ethos. Uh, we exactly. should just do it, and we should drive the the Bitcoin uh, innovation. I, I, I love that a lot. Really, really cool. Exactly. Perfect. Then yeah, uh, let's come to the other end routine, the last end routine, where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. And the question for you from the previous guest is, what is the most unexpected challenge you think we would face in a hyper Bitcoinist world? Most unexpected change would be, um, I don't know how to put this, but I would say breaking down the borders, opening up the borders it would make it easier, you know, traveling, sending information, sending data, uh, sending value would actually make it easier. So that, mm, that's that, like an uh, unexpected change that we should absolutely. be able to. Well, at least for us as Africans, it should be one of the biggest change that we'll be able to see. Absolutely. Yeah, really cool. Thank you so much. Then yeah, before I let you go, where can people find you and your work? Okay, so we are on Twitter. It's BTC underscore Dada, actually across all platforms. So uh, Twitter, BTC uh, underscore Dada. We're also on Instagram. We are also on LinkedIn as Bitcoin Dada. We also have a website, BTC uh, Dada dot com. So you can check out our work there. If you feel like supporting us in whatever level that you can, whether as a tutor, a mentor, you know, even just sending us sats, feel free, uh, check us out on our website and you'll be able to get that information. If you do want to come in as a tutor for our classes for the ladies, you can give me a DM on my personal page, which is Marcel Lorraine, uh, that's on Twitter. So just send me a uh, DM and say, I am well conversant with this particular um, topic. Probably it could be wallets and security and I would love to meet your girls and teach them. Our classes are online, so you don't have really to be here to, to partake or participate in our classes. So you can just do it online. Really cool. And I will put your uh, Twitter handle in the description as I do it with every guest. So if you want to check out a guest, always look in the description for a Twitter handle. I almost always have it in there. Sometimes guests don't have a Twitter, but that's rarely the case. <laughs> Almost everyone in Bitcoin has, has a Twitter. Uh, but then, yeah, thank you so much uh, for, for taking the time. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. Also, everyone that is watching and listening, uh, thank you for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Thank you for having me.